Good morning. It is um, Friday, September 25th, 9 a.m. here in San Francisco. I'm uh, so happy to welcome you all for another uh, wonderful geese and roasting technology webinar. Um, this will be a really cool webinar because we're finally able to to cover some topics that we wanted to cover for quite a while. And I will uh, tell you more about that soon. My name is Willem Boot, and we are broadcasting here live from Boot Coffee Campus in San Rafael, California, just uh, north of San Francisco. And with me is my colleague and friend, Marcus Young who is joining us as a uh, panel member, as a specialist. Marcus um, runs the uh, Boot. Marcus runs the uh, Boot Coffee Campus. And I'm just upgrading him to be a panel member. And Marcus um, should join us in a moment. And then I will uh, give him the opportunity also to explain what the today's program is in terms of the interactive roasting session. Um, let me first put up the slides for today because we have prepared this session quite well. We were um, roasting yesterday and the day before we were roasting and yesterday we were testing and today we are going to repeat some of that testing. And so I'm very excited to do that with you. And Marcus, if you can validate that you're looking at my full screen. I see Marcus thumbs up. That's great. Um, so today, September 25th, 2020, um, we are basically going to look at uh, some um, new topics very much related to how to manage some of the features of geese and roasting machines that are somewhat yeah, unexplored, I would say. Um, in the last webinar, which was, uh, boy, that is, time moves fast. It was uh, the last day of uh, August. I think it was August 31st. We covered a range of topics. We looked at, you know, what equipment out there would one need Gießen related equipment and Gießen equipment to start your roastery. We looked at the different sizes and models of uh, geese and roasters. Um, we also looked at equipment you might want to use um, on top of your purchase for your roastery, like lab equipment, what kind of other tools you might want to consider. Plus, we also did another review and an evaluation of the roasting profile. This was last time where you have the drying phase, then you have the phase where the Maillard reaction starts, and then the caramelization phase. Um, and we did, as I remember, that was a lot of fun. We did a roasting profile, a live roasting session actually, with a set point um, adjustment profile. And um, we did that during that session. And so today, we're specifically going to look at you know, how does the roast, roasting profile, how does it change as a result of adjustments in the um, drum speeds? And that's a feature that um, all Gießen machines um, use, or they, they offer you the capability to use that. And today we will also combine this feature in one of our trials that we already did with the adjustment of the air pressure. And that's very exciting. So, um, Marcus, um, are, you, uh, are you live present? How are you doing? Hey, Willem. Good to see you here today. And I'm super excited to taste these coffees. Um, for our attendees, as you can see from the title of our presentation, 
Today we're going to fold in the aspect of drum speed in our assessment of these coffees. And we have a great coffee that we're roasting um, through a series of trials from Colombia. This is a project that we're involved with along with USAID and others in Colombia called Coffee for Peace. And this is a blend of coffees from Cauca, Colombia that was part of our virtual buyer's caravan. Um, just a little bit of details on this coffee. It had a little bit of a higher moisture content. This is a very fresh coffee, 12.5%, um, but a fairly stable water activity at 0.61. This is a dense coffee uh, at 0.7 grams per milliliter. So there's a lot of cellular material in there. So as I'm roasting, I have to think about that density and this high moisture content, along with kind of a moderate bean, bean size with screen size 16, 17. So um, you know, what this really means is we're just taking this coffee. It's a coffee that's perfect for these kinds of trials. Um, we know this coffee profile quite well. It's a coffee that scores oh, 85, 86 points with um, chocolate, a rich sort of thick, sometimes syrupy body, citric acid notes, and occasionally some um, really nice fruit characteristics. So I think for these trials using drum speed on the Gieson, um, we'll have a lot to play with because we'll really get to see how that impacts that very distinct body, the acidity that has so pronounced in this coffee, um, but also the delicate characteristics that can can be coaxed out of this coffee. Thank you, Marcus. So from a general roasting approach, um, thinking out of the scope of today's uh, webinar, which focuses a bit more on drum speed, how would you normally approach the roasting of such a coffee that's higher density, higher elevation? Most coffees in Colombia, they grow over well over 1600 meters. So how would you um, approach sh such a roasting profile in general? Yeah, I think what, what really stands out to me, just looking at the physical characteristics of this coffee, is that it is pretty high density. But the other characteristic that I want to be mindful of is this high moisture content. So, you know, moisture can be quite a good con con conduit of energy. So with the high moisture content, if I give it too much heat too fast, I can just really race through that roast. Um, but I know because of this higher density, I need to give it a lot of energy to push it through the roast. So I'm keeping those things in mind and we'll use a little bit of a restrained charge temperature uh, soak. So that period at the beginning of the roast with low to no heat for the first uh, 45 seconds to a minute, maybe a minute and a half. Um, that'll sort of let that moisture start to gradually dehydrate and dry off during that drying phase. But then I'm going to be prepared to give it quite a bit of energy um, early, early on once I turn on the gas, because I know that with this density, this coffee can really take the heat and it kind of needs the heat early on to penetrate to the center of the bean. And then the coffee itself will kind of drive the roasting process through the end. So I should be prepared to let off the gas as we approach the exothermic reaction. So to summarize, you incorporate the fact that the moisture is relatively high and on the other side, there is a higher density. So you're trying to take these two counterbalancing um, uh, effects into equation, right? Exactly, exactly. So I'm accounting for the moisture with that longer soak, I'm accounting for that higher density by giving it a reasonably high um, amount of gas as I start adding gas to the roast. Cool. Let's um, look at some aspects related to the Gießen machines where it comes to the drum speed. And let's see. Okay. Here you can see for the W6 and the W15A, for these two models specifically, 
when you look at um, the setting of the drum speed, which is basically a setting in Hertz, and Hertz is the, the voltage frequency, basically, the power frequency of the roaster, that's the number actually that you adjust on your operator panel. So that relates directly with the RPMs. And um, with the W6A and the W15A, if you run your machine at 40 hertz, it will run 58 RPMs. At 50 hertz, 73 RPMs. And at 60 hertz, it's um, 87 RPM. So um, with the W1A, and I think we did for this roasting trial, the coffees that we're actually using, we roasted them on our W1A. It's slightly different, and I'll show you that in a second. But what actually, that's the you know, million dollar question right now. So what does drum speed do to the roast profile of the coffee? And we did some um, uh, advanced experimentation with this, with some cupping. And we've come to the conclusion is that um, drum speed, where um, it's literally the speed of the drum that regulates also how fast the coffee moves through the drum and also moves through the airflow that runs through the drum. The speed is directly exposing the roasting profile. It's accelerating the roasting profile quite a bit. So if I, if I turn my drum speed up, then the coffee moves faster through the airflow. So there's more, you could say, uh, more convection heat. Convection heat is heat transfer with preheated air. Plus, if I run my drum faster, the beans will also push a bit more towards the outside of the drum, so towards the walls of the drum. And that, as a result, will apply relatively spoken, a bit more conductive heat. So my heat transfer intensifies. And um, if we, and I'll, I'll ask uh, Marcus in a second for some input as well on his observations in this matter. But here we look at the um, drum speed of the W1A, which is um, um, the machine that we did our roast trials on for today's webinar and you can see here if i run my w1a at 40 hertz it's 44 rpms 50 is 56 rpms and 60 is 68 rpms and um so it correlates quite well with the other uh, models of machines as well so let me ask you um, let me ask you marcus what has been so far your what has been so far your observation in regards of the roasting profile with the adjustment of the drum speed? Wow, I think adjusting the drum speed has the biggest impact on at least the way a profile progresses of almost any change that I've, that I've made in the roaster. Um, I mean, of course, burner has a huge impact, but when you think about drum speed, when you think about airflow, when you think about a soak versus not soak, soaking at the beginning of a roast, I was shocked at how difficult it was to follow and match a profile by changing drum speed. The sensory milestones that the coffee traveled through happened at very different temperatures. The turning points happened at very different points. So overall, it was really challenging um, trying to match profiles playing with drum speed. And so there's a, there's a question here, and it's a good question, I think. Is there a rule of thumb for adjusting speed for batch sizes? In other words, should speed be higher or slower for smaller batches? And this client uses the um, W15A. Um, Marcus, any comment on this, um, adjusting drum speed versus smaller batch sizes? Um, you know, I think on a Gießen particularly, drum speed, um, we'll see what we taste in the cup, right? But my initial impression is that drum speed is something that I would 
approach changing with caution. I think um, yeah, the Giessen has a huge factor in its favor for roasting batches of various drum sizes. And one of that is the air pressure, um, which controls the fan speed, which we discussed in a previous webinar. And you know, when I think about air pressure, I think about a drum that has 100% capacity worth of coffee in it versus a drum at 20% capacity and the vastly different ways that air flow is going to move through that drum. Um, and the fact that Giesen maintains a consistent air pressure is a huge tool for roasting different sizes. Um, when it comes to drum speed particularly, I can only make some conjecture which I can imagine that perhaps um, a slower drum speed with a smaller batch size could perhaps help you to match the profiles. I'm just thinking about the contact time of bean to bean and bean to drum and the relationship of conductive heat transfer. So let, let me stop you there. Was, yep. So the contact time be, bean to bean that refers to the fact that during roasting, there's this conductive heat from the walls of the drum to the beans, but also there's a significant impact of the conductive heat between the beans. That's what you refer to, right? Exactly, exactly. We have this relationship of conductivity, that's bean to bean and bean to drum, and convection heating our coffee. That's the air moving past the beans. And so, in a larger batch size, you have more conductive heat transfer because you're not just conveying heat from the drum wall to the beans, but you have more beans interacting with each other as well. So I think by slowing down the drum speed and allowing those coffee beans kind of a slower time passing over the burner, over that hot spot on the roasting drum as the drum spins around, you may be mimicking some of that um, conductive heat transfer that happens with more bean to bean in a larger batch. I'm just hypothesizing here. I hope that our, our listener tries it out for themselves and gets back to us with their results. And so I've, I've had or I have some clients who, for example, with their W15A, they like to be able to roast really small batches, like let's say one kilo. So if you roast one kilo in a W15A, then obviously one complication is that your beans in relation to the thermocouple, the bean thermocouple, they're not going to touch that thermocouple in the same way. So your bean temperature registration really happens in a different way. It's less reliable. But often I hear, you know, hey, can I roast one kilo in a W15, which is a minimal capacity utilization and in those circumstances i would recommend you know a, a reduction of drum speed could indeed be of help and with that potentially also a slight reduction in the air pressure which induces a reduction in air flow um, but again if you're doing drum speed adjustments then do it in relatively small steps at a time. And I would say, you know, do it uh, with steps of five hertz at a time, which translates to somewhere to around five to six RPMs. That's my, my general uh, rule of thumb. Yeah, and I, I just want to add to that a little anecdote from a buddy of mine who was competing in the World Roasting Championship several years ago. These are competitions that are held on Giessen Roasters, Giesen's a sponsor. He was really prepared. We had spent a lot of time here in our lab near San Francisco doing roasting trials, preparing him, getting him familiar with the machine. He steps up on the stage at the world competition to roast his coffee, and his coffee behaves totally differently than expected. Well, what happened? It turned out that a previous competitor was using drum speed as a major component of their profile and it changed the drum speed sort of out of the realm of um, the baseline for that roaster that, that my buddy had become familiar with. And when he stepped up to the roaster, it was like almost impossible to match his profile because of that drum speed adjustment. So 
it's a major, a major change and one that's really exciting to play with. And as Willem says, small adjustments, just move in baby steps as you, as you undertake this. Before we, we move, move on, there's another really interesting question that came in. And here, here it is, cool question. Do you and Marcus have drum speed preferences over certain characteristics like varietals, elevations, or processing? And I'll, I'll take a first step at this um, question because this relates to you know three different key um, bean char characteristics, the variety, the elevation at which it's grown, and the processing style. And I'll, I'll take the first one in, in relation to varieties, varieties, you know, there are varietals that tend to produce denser beans, and there are varietals that, because of the way they genetically impact the beans, that tend to um, create beans that are more heat sensitive. For example, um, varieties like Pacamara, Maragogipe, these are bolder beans. They tend to be, if you measure the density, it's a relatively low density. So and I would definitely say those varieties can benefit from a slightly slower drum speed. And also at some point in the rows, they could benefit from a slightly um, lower airspeed. And I'm saying at some point in the rows, because remember when you're doing these types of um, adjustments, you don't have to, with the Gießen roasting technology, and with the software, you don't have to take one drum speed and continue that the whole batch. No, you can actually adjust the drum speed during the roast. Remember, when I'm actually roasting coffee, then the beans, they are losing mass significantly. They expand and they lose weight, so they lose significant amounts of mass. And that by itself can be a justification for um, drum speed adjustments. And then Marcus, what can you add where you where, where we look at elevation or processing? How would you, um, from a um, conceptual perspective, how would you adjust drum speed when you look at those two perspectives? I think with, um, you know, with, with drum speed, when I consider processing particularly, you know, when I'm roasting a honey processed coffee or a natural processed coffee. I often want to be a little bit more delicate, especially in my conductive heat early on in the roast. So, you know, I, I can foresee a time when I would make some drum speed adjustments to accommodate that, um, where, you know, I would be looking for more convection and using drum speed to control that um, with a, perhaps a natural processed coffee. Um, yeah, I think with a higher density coffee, I might go a little bit in the opposite direction and look for a little bit more convection or that heat transfer from hot airflow. Um, and again, I could use my drum speed to try to get those, those beans for that batch size following through that stream of hot air kind of more readily aiding in that convective heat transfer. So theoretically, um, I, those are some trials that I would, that I would undertake. I think um, that's a great question, and it's one that hopefully, when we step over to the cupping table in just a little bit here, we'll have some more clarification on which characteristics from a sensory standpoint are highlighted with higher versus lower drum speeds and with a set drum speed, but with different air speeds. And so, so, so to, sorry to interrupt you, but you touched on an interesting topic here because during roasting, um, you have with the, these geese and roasters, you basically have the option, the possibility to manipulate the um, convection heat transfer as well as the conductive heat transfer. And so, and it's interesting that you mentioned with these higher elevation, higher density beans, you would, it sounds like you would prefer to use convection heat to accelerate heat transfer over conductive heat transfer because you're saying that with convection heat you're more um, 
efficiently bringing heat to the bean, specifically to the core of the bean. Is that what you're referring to? I am. I am. And I think, you know, with these high density beans, I'm, I'm often hunting for more enzymatic and acid driven flavors in the coffee. Um, you know, I often want roasts that are a little bit more compressed and, you know, I'm, I'm want to be maybe a little bit more delicate on the conduction so that I don't kind of overdo it with those um, sugar browning notes and those sort of heavier characteristics. Now, that's not true for every and, coffee. As, and I see a question here coming in. What is he talking about? Enzymatic and acid promoting profiles. Well, what, what is this all about? Yeah, that's a perfect question because I know we, we get in the weeds here sometimes. Um, you know, I think if you're at all familiar with the old SCA flavor wheel, as we colloquially started calling it, um, on the aromatic side, we start with sort of enzymatic flavors. Those are those fresh fruit flavors, those citric acid, those fresh apples, those citrus fruits, and even those floral characteristics. Those qualities that are often found in high grown coffees and those qualities that are kind of encapsulated in a lighter roast. When we talk about more sugar browning flavors, that's when we get into more dried fruits, vanilla, chocolate, caramel type flavors, um, indicative of slightly darker roasts, but also of certain coffees that I think, um, you know, we think of those lower grown Brazils that maybe don't quite have the density, but that still have a lot of those complex, but more sugar sweet flavors than fresh fruit flavors. So in other words, um, if I'm trying to make some conclusions on this, this is fascinating and complicated. It's all very complex that with higher elevation, coffees using convection heat, you have the ability at a lighter roast profile, right? We're talking about lighter roast. You have the ability to potentially highlight more these fruits and potentially floral notes than you would have with conductive heat. Is that correct? Yeah, in, in my experience working on these, uh, specifically the geese and roasters, that's absolutely the case. I can have a shorter roast time a more compressed development time, still have a fully developed coffee that doesn't taste grassy or grainy and underdeveloped. And to do that, I'm using more convection, less conduction. And so that's interesting because if we look at that balance between convection and conduction, so we actually did these roasting trials with where we basically looked at um, increase, sorry, decreasing the drum speed. And we had the last roasting experiment, we increased airflow. And I will um, kind of give a first summary of what we did and then Marcus will run us through the roasting experiment we did. Um, and we actually recorded this using the um, Keys and Roast Profile software. And so we did five batches in total um, the load capacity was 750 grams of coffee. They were all roasted to as close as possible to the same endpoints measured in uh, the Ektron Gourmet style, measured on a Javalytics type of uh, color meter. And you can see in the um, first and second column, you can see the drum speed settings we used for these roasts. And then um, you can read the airflow settings we used, the PA. So we, we all, for the first four, we used 140 PA. For the last one, 175, which is basically an increase in pressure, which usually gives you a higher airflow. And then we used the color settings, 58 for the beans and 71 for the grounds, as you saw it with the, um, um, first two and then the other three very similar and then the temperature and color change at 300 degrees Fahrenheit or 149 degrees Celsius at the first batch we saw a major color change so that also indicates that the caramelization phase really starts showing up uh, and then with the first roast we had a roast type of 11 minutes five seconds 
and the development type of one minute and 55 seconds yielding into a development percentage of 17.3. And you can see for the other batches, we had very um, somewhat similar results. Um, you can see some changes here. And it will be interesting to, of course, you know, look at this table and then think of, you know, what would we expect from the results of these roasts versus what do we find in the flavor profile, right? So in, in my opinion, all these um, um, adjustments, all these experiments are really useful when you're doing diligent copying of the results so that you understand what a drum speed of 60 versus 50 versus 40 does in the cup. And that then, in theory, allows you to really get a good handle, a good grip on um, using your roaster settings as tools in this yeah, intricate process of creating yeah, flavor profiles, right? Um, so let's look at the uh, roast profiles and then maybe Marcus, you can give us the rundown on these. Can you use my, um, do you have access to the, you don't. Huh? So I will start this profile and then I will accelerate through it and then you tell me where to slow down. So now we are entering in towards two minutes in the roast. This is the first batch, 60 Hertz versus yeah. 140 PA. Yeah, so with, you know, this batch was partly just a batch to preheat the roaster. Um, you'll see we kind of repeated this roast with the same basic um, parameters in the roasting machine. But you know, here you can see in that first minute and a half, I used that gradual application of heat. You can see I've got a fairly linear rate of rise going here. That's the yellow line down at the bottom. You can see um, fairly stable delta at this point between the bean temperature and the air temperature. That's the red line versus the blue line at the top. And you can also see a fairly high application of gas for this batch size, 50% of the capacity of the roaster, a high application of gas early on, tapering off towards the end. Um, you can see a few little bumps of the gas and the rate of rise towards the end of the roast, just from kind of a prolonged look at the trier. And here you'll also see at this high drum speed, we had um, color change happening at um, about 50% of the roast. So, you know, it's, I think one profile in isolation isn't super interesting, um, but I used that as the reference now for corresponding batches. Now the machine is preheated We've come up to the same 60% gas with a very similar soak for this roast. Um, we still have this kind of linear rate of rise going here. And off the gas into color change and taking the roast onto the end. So quite a similar, similar profile, which we would expect. The only difference being that the machine had heated up a little bit. But I think let's go on to the next slide, Willem, which should show something quite different with 50 hertz on the drum speed and 140 Pascal. Here you can see I've got the gas is lower at this point. There's only 10% um, gas now, even before color change. And color change was happening at a very different temperature it was harder to control this roast. I had a, a bean temperature that was a little squirrely relative to the reference. So you can see that rate of rise with those little power pulses to keep this roast is, moving on. Is, is that these, these, these I don't, they call these dips or flicks in the rate of rise, is that, what is that? Is that the trier, the sampler, or what is that um, caused by? That was caused, if you look at that dip that happened around nine minutes, that was from pulling the trier. The two previous dips were because the, um, in attempting to use the set point to guide this roast, um, that approach was failing me a little bit. Um, 
things were happening at such different temperatures because of the difference in drum speed that I needed, as I, as I slowed down my drum speed, I needed to set a higher set point. That set point is based on the air temperature. So the other way to think about that is I was experiencing a higher air temperature relative to my bean temperature as I slowed down my drum speed. So just one of the things that made it quite unpredictable. And now here we're at even a slower drum speed. We're only at 40 hertz now. We're still at 140 Pascal. You see I'm making some changes to my burner. I made some changes to my set point. And boom, you can see that much, much faster roast now. My bean temperature is much hotter. My air temperature is much hotter. You know, I, I suspect that in the case of the bean temperature, this has to do with the longer time that my bean mass is in contact with my bean thermocouple at a slower drum speed. It's kind of idling past it more slowly as opposed to kind of racing past it with a higher drum speed, but I'm not certain. And, and so what happens when the drum rotates that much slower, the beans are, um, or what happens actually? The beans move slower through the air, but they are falling more on the bottom side, bottom part of the drum where they, you have the hotter spots as well, right? Exactly, exactly. So the beans could be hotter. They could be in contact with that thermocouple more often. Um, we saw, as we noticed in the chart, that the temperatures at which what we would call yellowing or the color change was happening, that, that change in aromatics to hay was happening at very different temperatures. And you can see how you know, I'm maintaining a lower rate of rise for this roast because of this excess energy. But that first note that I inserted around six and a half minutes, that's when color change happened. So at a much longer time than in my previous roasts. And then this last one, we wanted to see this relationship between airflow and this was a very different roast. We had a slightly darker end color at the same temperature. We had much more airflow. Now we were using 175 Pascals of pressure versus 140, but at the same slowest drum setting. And it's fascinating to watch this because we had a very long time to yellowing again and once first crack happened, I made a note there that that dip was from the trier. I also miscalculated first crack. Um, we ended up with a very short development time. We had a development time of only like 10%. Um, and I think, you know, just one more interesting thing to note as we go from the faster drum speeds to the slower drum speeds was the quality of first crack. Um, it was quite pronounced, dynamic, and compressed, that, that first crack. It kind of went into it fast, was quite explosive when you heard it, and then wrapped up pretty quickly. In these slower drum speeds, first crack kind of gradually started with a lot of outliers before finally kind of rolling into first crack with the whole bean mass. So it was uh, really interesting the way that these sensory characteristics changed throughout the roast. And so, uh, Marcus, let me go back. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Here, I'm, I'm looking at the um, overview again, the summary. There's a question. Um, I have the drying phase set to 305 and check the marked for Meyer on crack, but it never shows the Meyer phase. How do I change this? I guess this is a, an adjustment in the software that they need to do at their end, right? It is, yeah. I'll, um, I'll show that on my recording. I think we're going to do a live roasting session. So when I load up my profiler for that, I can show right where this setting is. What it refers to is the Giesem profiler is set so that color change is automatically captured by the profiling software at the temperature you specify. Um, 
Now, you know, of course, it was interesting mm. in these trials to learn that as we changed the drum speed, the color change was actually happening at a different recorded temperature. So I was using the note function to kind of record that, but it, it's just something to watch out for. If you are recording profiles and changing um, drum speeds, using different drum speeds for different profiles, you know, I would recommend setting up your profiler in the settings each time so that you're capturing that color change at an accurate temperature for the machine settings and the coffee settings. And so here's an interesting question just came in. How would you get a relatively good result from a green coffee that is not as fresh, um, that has a lower moisture level or even a smaller screen size? So a lot of questions inside this question. Um, <laughs> I, I would say, you know, coffees that are super fresh are typically um, harder to deal with, uh, like with this coffee that we're using uh, now, which literally we've had here for less than six weeks. And so typically to get the best results, the best repetitive results, I would say you would be better off with a coffee that is not super fresh, that has a little bit of age and a lower moisture level the same. Ideally, coffees should have um, a moisture level between 10 to 12 percent. The coffee we've been using here is a bit higher. Um, and then Marcus, how would you take a smaller screen size into consideration in the extreme case like a pea berry? So how would that um, influence these profiles that we're doing here? Uh, that's a great question about bean size and, and sometimes a little bit of a controversial one. Um, so I'm going to answer it in a little bit of a backdoor way. I'm going to say, imagine if you charged your roaster with the same batch size, the same charge temperature for both bean and air temperature. One roast was using a larger bean, like a 17, 18 screen size, and another roast was using a pea berry. Now what happens if you do that is you will find that your turning point comes at a lower temperature with the pea berry. Now, why is that? It's because with the pea berry or with a very small screen size, you have more surface area for the same mass of coffee than with a larger bean size. So kind of going at it with that in mind, um, there's a few other things to consider that smaller bean size, each individual bean is going to absorb energy more easily. It's gonna be easier to penetrate into the middle. It doesn't have as far to travel through the center cut of the bean. So it's kind of a balancing act. I use a higher charge temperature to account for that bigger dip at the turning point and that excess surface area of a smaller bean. Smaller bean, higher charge temperature but I offset that by being prepared to use less gas early on in my roast. So it's, it's a tricky combination, but I think what's important to think about is surface area. Anything to add to that, Willem, as you're, we're setting up to cup over here? No, I think, you know, um, we, we've been getting these questions more than often. Uh, about surface area and how does it relate to the bean size and you know it's a uh, it's interesting stuff but I also want to take into consideration we're running out of time as always with these webinars so and here I have um, uh, five samples that I've lined up here Marcus is on the other side we're we're still in the midst of uh, our COVID restrictive uh, cupping measures here and uh, I'm just going to um, cup while you all listen and watch. I'm going to cup these five coffees. And uh, remember, these five coffees, um, batch one was, um, batch one and two were with a higher airflow, batch three and four, sorry, with a higher drum speed, batch three and four with a lower drum speed, batch five even with a, even a lower drum speed and then batch five, we actually um, increase the airflow. And so let's see what we uh, find in these flavor profiles while we cup these.
um, like the difference between going from a higher drum speed to a slightly lower drum speed seems to be that the acidity is more, a bit more pronounced, a bit, a bit more pronounced in terms of sweetness also. And the same with um, the fourth profile, which was the, the fourth profile, Marcus, was a drum speed of 40, if I remember. And it was a airflow of uh, 140, correct? Correct. correct. Yeah. And then if we go from that setting, so from an airflow at 40, at 140 PA to an airflow in the fifth batch at 175 PA, then you know, I, I do indeed taste the impact of that, that that acidity is just, it opens up much more, indicating that that extra convection heat was able to um, expose more of the acidity of the coffee. Um, and so, interestingly, batch five, I find it interesting is that um, the sweetness of that coffee has uh, uh, been given an extra dimension, it seems like. Marcus, you you just cupped these um, samples. What what is your um, perception? Yeah, I think it's so interesting that on cups one and two, they have a lot of acidity, but it's not a pleasant acidity. It's an acidity that's a little bit um, harsh, a little bit aggressive, um, and that's kind of supported by a heightened level of astringency. I think as we move to the slower drum speeds, the mouthfeel improves. It becomes slicker, um, a little more silky. If I had to pick a winner, I actually like the middle roast. That might just be familiarity because that's very typical settings where we roast kind of day in, day out, kind of omni profiles here. But um, like you, I thought that final roast, that fifth roast, um, is really compelling in its own right. And it's a path that I would want to go down for further exploration because I like the, the tension between the kind of brown sugar sweetness. It's a little bit more of a complex sweetness um, and the acidity that I think is reminiscent to me of the acidity I found in cup three as well. So I think there's kind of two interesting directions to pursue. Shall we, are you ready to start roasting? Anytime soon? Cool. Yeah. I'm making you co host. That would mean, yeah. So now, okay. Uh, turn your uh, microphone on, please. All right, everybody. So I, um, it's good to see you. I've got a batch here ready to roll. I've got my profiler queued up here. I am going to run at the highest speed that this roaster will allow, just as a one more trial here. I did want to show folks where in the settings you can record your drying phase. So here I'm recording it at 157. This is in Celsius. So if you're used to roasting in Fahrenheit, you've got to do a little bit of a translation here. Um, but it's just here in settings and that will automatically trigger that drying phase in your roast profile. But I think here we're ready to roll. So let's um, go ahead and start our roast. I'm gonna just record it without delay. I just charged my batch. I have my power off. I'm going to take this soak approach once again. So the soak approach is specifically to uh, allow the excess moisture of the coffee to to kind of escape, right? It is. Yeah. It's you know it's it's kind of a gentle way to start a roast. Um, the soak kind of ironically enough also works for very dry coffees that might be inclined to um, tipping or are you scorching a little bit early in the roast? Um, 
but yeah, I, I like it because it's, it feels like I get a much more accurate reading on my bean temperature probe right at the beginning of the roast. But I don't want to overdo it, so I am going to come up with a little bit of power to get us started. So right here at the turning point, you'll notice this profile looks different than what we saw in the earlier recordings. I'm actually doing this trial on our WPG sample roaster. Um, the main reason being, it's a very pragmatic reason, our W1A is quite noisy for the webinar, whereas the WPG or the W6 even are a little more quiet. So I wanted to make sure to use this, um, this approach on this roaster. I'm gonna come up on the power a little bit more here. And you'll notice I'm using a set point. Um, it's a technique that I like um, just because it ensures that I don't end up with too much energy into the coffee. This is kind of the, the bare bones way of using the set point on this roaster. Set it at an air temperature that vaguely corresponds to where you might expect exothermic reactions to start happening, where you expect those beans to start generating their own heat um, or a little bit earlier than that. And that set point then will reduce the fuel at the point where that's happening. So you end up with a nice declining, slowing curve to your roast. And we're off. Coffee, a little bit darker green as that moisture drives to the surface. It smells very moist, very fresh grass. Got a nice profile going. This, you all are the, the witnesses of my first attempt at this high drum speed on this roaster. So if you're lucky, you'll get to see me chasing my tail a little bit with this, with this batch. Um, a small batch size, we're doing 175 grams on this smaller roaster. So the results, if, they're, if they totally fall off, aren't too significant. And so, uh, Marcus, the um, uh, rate of rise at the peak was here at around 22, 21, 22 degrees, right? That's pretty high, right? That is. That's quite high. Um, yeah. And that's and 22 degrees for that's 22 degrees for 30 seconds, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And um, and that was only with 30% um, gas when we came to that point. But you know, when I look at this roaster too, my turning point is at 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And I know that first crack on this machine, I usually expect it at about 360. So figuring my turning point was at about one minute. If I wanna hit first crack around eight or nine minutes, um, yeah, that's 160 degrees that my temperature needs to traverse before hitting first crack. So on this machine, I do need a higher average rate of rise than maybe on the W1. And so just to, to recap the numbers that we're looking at now, so from left to right, you know, 415 air temperature, 311 bean temperature, that means, you know, we are um, it, well into the Maillard reactions, right? Um, um, it's, it's just now picking up some yellow color. Okay. So again, this is, I think, that indication of, as we change drum speed, we have odd reactions for Maillard. So here yeah. the roaster, based on that set point, recorded it um, right here. So at about 316 degrees. I would say, having been smelling the coffee, it probably happened a little bit later than that. Um, I would say it probably happened more at 440, maybe than 435 when it was recorded. Okay. But and it still happened relatively fast. So I'm getting ready to really come off of my gas a little bit and try to bring this rate of rise down. Yeah, and 70 hertz drum speed, that's 20 hertz higher than I think Giesen ships the machines by default. So this is a fast drum speed. Um, and then this we have the 140 PA. Yep, I cannot, I cannot increase my drum speed over this on this machine. Um, yeah, and 140 PA is um, 
is a fairly high air pressure, you know, when we look at the range of adjustability we have. The, the, the low range, the, on the low end, um, the air pressure is 80 PA, and on the high, it's like close to 200, right? Yep. I'm just running through the numbers. Ah, it lets me go to 250 on this machine. Um, I think that that's higher than on some of the larger machines. Exactly, yeah. And, but interesting, in case you didn't know that, there is a, an option that you can program this on your Gison in the back end of the software. You need to ask your uh, representative for a special code to get into that back end, but that's where you can All the texts are going to be mad at us now, Willem. Are they supposed to know about these, these secret settings? <laughs> <laughs> We'll let David chime in on that later on. Yep. <laughs> but no, there are powerful tools to be able to make those adjustments. Yep. So I, I think you're right. I encourage people to know and to get full advantage of their machine. But yeah, I mean, you can see I've got a, a pretty, you know, if, if the shape of a curve is any indication, it's a beautiful profile. Um, things are happening maybe a little fast. I think that's just the in unpredictability perhaps of, um, of some of these changes um, the first time you attempt, attempt to batch with them. So I just reduced my power to just 1%. And I can see here, even though I had my set point at 415, you know, boy, my, my air temperature has just been cruising along right at 399 Fahrenheit. So my set point, at this high drum speed, it was perhaps a little hot. And I just heard an outlier of a, of a, of a pop. So it doesn't quite smell like it's there yet. It's a small batch size, so it may not be a dynamic first crack. So there for we reference, go. we're now at 188 degrees C. 189. And I just marked first crack at that point. So right at eight minutes, a little fast, but not crazy. Now that pop is really becoming more dynamic. Um, you know, sometimes there's coffees where you just don't hear them pop at all, either from the roasting approach that you took or perhaps um, something about the coffee I think in this case, um, it could be, you know, something about this drum speed, but I could clearly smell that first crack had started. So I went ahead and recorded it. Now I'm in a little bit of danger with my rate of rise, because as I said, this high drum speed, who the heck knows what I'm doing, I'm trying to catch up and get to a point that I feel good about. So I've got a little bit of the dreaded flip, if you believe in that. I think this is just a very sensitive thermocouple. And the coffee smells great. Um, I was just pulling the trier, so you're seeing my rate of rise bounce a little bit, just because of the proximity of the opening for the trier and the thermocouple. I don't really think my rate of rise is in quite the desperate situation that the data might tell you. So it's important to know your coffee and I think balance off roasting based on data and roasting using your eyes, ears, and nose. And so, so now we are at 17% development. And I am stopping this roast. It smells amazing. Nice. So here we are. I will go wow, ahead and very cool. save this coffee for peace. 70 Hertz roast. Excellent. So, Marcus, we're at the end of the hour. So, what um, is your takeaway conclusion of this specific profile that we did at 70 hertz drum speed? Yeah, I think um, things happen faster than I expected. Um, and overall, though, I felt like it was, I had good control. The qualities of the sensory milestones, the quality of that first crack was more drawn out and subdued than I expected. That's kind of in conflict from what I experienced 
roasting at higher drum speeds on the W1A. So take that for what it's worth. I'm not sure what that's telling us, but it warrants more investigation. And this is a batch that'll be awesome to taste as well, I think. Um, that's of course the, the proof of the pudding is to taste it, to do comparative blind tasting also. Um, I'm getting one final question before we close this webinar. This actually is a perfect introduction of our last slide that we... Willem, you are muted, buddy. Oh, there we go. I wanted to say I'm just getting a suitable last question for this webinar, and that's in regards of... Um, what other ways are there to learn about these types of topics? And I think now you can see our full screen. So we have um, uh, various um, remote learning webinars that we teach. Uh, roasting business fundamentals coming up October 20 and 22. We have a roast profiling workshop where we are touching also on topics related to what we were um, showing you today on October 16. There's a really cool um, webinar on scoring with the SCA form October 26. And we of course will have another Gießen webinar coming up um, the end of October. And um, you will all be very welcome for that. The uh, topics will be announced soon for that. Thank you very much um, from all the parts of the world where you joined from. It was great seeing you. I hope this was fun and instructive and inform, in, inform, from the information that it was helpful for you. Good luck. Have a great weekend and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.